So uh, we agreed that you will introduce yourselves. Uh, you, you have some time to, to, to do that. It can be a, a, a longer uh, introduction. So what is your, uh, many of you know you, but as this is a, a recorded session and some students who, who would join in maybe don't know you, um, please tell us what is your current position and affiliation? What is your background? Um, what are your current research interests? And then we have two uh, separate questions we wanted to you to, to answer. What is your favorite definition of a knowledge graph? And what is your favorite knowledge graph? So who wants to go first? You define an order, someone? right? Yeah. So then, then we can do it from the way I see you, you all. So that this would start with Lydia. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I'm Lydia. I'm the product manager for Wikidata. I work for Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, my background is in computer science. I studied uh, computer science at uh, KIT in Karlsruhe. Um, where also some of the other people here on the panel um, did some of their work. Um, and I've been involved with free software projects for quite some time. Um, current research interests, I am not researching in the sense that uh, you all are, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm really interested in seeing more of those. Uh, research being done, uh, among them explainable AI, um, how to measure data quality and improve it, and how to scale up Wikidata's query service to make it possible for many more people to do many more queries. And uh, then you asked us about our favorite definition of knowledge graph. And coming from Wikimedia, I of course have to look at Wikipedia for the textbook definition, so to say. And Wikipedia says, uh, a knowledge graph is a knowledge base that uses a graph structured data model or topology to integrate data. Knowledge graphs are often used to store interlinked descriptions of entities, objects, events, situations, or abstract concepts with free from semantics. Uh, that's where we try. So whenever someone asks me, what are you working on? <laughs> I break that down to how machines understand our world and the connections between those things better. Um, and my favorite knowledge graph, well, obviously I'm super biased. <laughs> I will have to say Wikidata to this. <laughs> if Wikidata is off the table, I would go for Music Brains. Okay, thank you very much. Marta. Hello, good evening. Uh, thanks, Bernard, for inviting me to, to be on this panel with all the illustrious co-panelists. So I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, so, uh, my name is Marta Sabo. Um, this year I started a position at uh, TU Wien uh, based on an FWF funded uh, Elisa Richter Fellowship, which is roughly equivalent to an assistant professorship, so, so just for simplicity. Uh, and this gave me also the possibility to uh, establish a research group on semantic systems. So, we are doing a broad range of, of research in theoretical and applied aspects of semantic systems are uh, very much related also to knowledge acquisition but also data integration semantic search auditable systems uh, and we're also uh, often like to build uh, software yeah? so we really build software for uh, in many applied uh, research projects um, personally my background is in the semantic web area so i've been in this area for since my PhD and actually I had the chance to know you all and work with uh, all the panelists. We were in several projects uh, for, for ages now. Uh, so this is a, a really nice uh, community uh, that I feel very involved in. Uh, so now let's go to the questions that uh, we had to answer uh, relating the definition of knowledge graphs. So when I'm in a semantic web uh, community, then I just like to say, well, knowledge graphs, you know, they are just ontologies with many instances that span several domains, right? So this is the one-liner for students. Uh, but what's nice about knowledge graphs is that they are a concept taken up by so many diverse communities that we have to exit our comfort zone, right? Our little semantic web corner 
uh, and find definitions that are acceptable also for other communities. Uh, so when I, while I was preparing, I reviewed several definitions, and the one that I like more is actually one that the Marcus uh, coined in 2016. Um, he was uh, co-editing a special issue on uh, on knowledge graphs in uh, the Journal of Web Semantics. So let me read this. I haven't yet uh, uh, learned it by heart. It says, knowledge graphs are large networks of entities, their semantic types, properties, and relationships between entities. So I think this is a good common denominator, right, that people from different disciplines uh, using knowledge graphs uh, could agree on. So I would vote for this definition, at least for tonight. Um, okay, and then relating to the favorite knowledge graph, so this is actually a new a new love. I discovered the knowledge graph uh, so about a few weeks ago uh, during ISWC. There was a tutorial on common sense knowledge graphs. So this goes very much in the idea what Lydia was saying, right? That knowledge graphs help machines understand our world and our conception about the world. And uh, common sense knowledge graphs really go in this direction. They really try to capture this background knowledge that is not written anywhere, right? So, for example, that when you throw a ball uh, to a dog, the dog can catch the ball, but the dog cannot uh, throw the ball himself, right? So, this kind of, of the there's a whole area of this common sense knowledge graphs, and in this area, there's a rather new knowledge graph called Atomic, which stands for an Atlas of Machine Common Sense from the University of Washington and the Allen Institute for AI. Uh, so I guess you haven't heard about this because it's quite new. It's been published at AAAI in 2019. Uh, and what's very nice about this uh, common sense knowledge graph is that it's uh, the first non-taxonomic uh, knowledge graph, right? So instead of uh, listing entities and subclass relations, it actually captures uh, uh, cause and effect relations uh, between different actions. So, for example, uh, somebody uh, is repelling somebody's action because they want to defend themselves or because they feel threatened, uh, and as a result, they might hurt the other person, get arrested, and so on and so forth. So, this is really takes this vision of, of knowledge, type of knowledge that we represent uh, in a different direction that we are used to, and this is why uh, I like it very much, uh, also because in um, recent projects we've been confronted with representing causality knowledge, and it's really becoming a, a component, an important com component in many semantic systems. Uh, and one last thing why I like it, uh, I, for this conference it's very relevant, so uh, they currently have about one million of these relations, of course, effect relations, so quite a lot, uh, and they have all uh, acquired it through crowdsourcing, right? So they used Amazon Mechanical Turk to collect it. Uh, and I think maybe this is interesting for this community of uh, Semantic Media Wiki, yes, because you are focusing on, on knowledge acquisition. Uh, so for this particular knowledge graph, they went for uh, crowdsourcing as a, as a software support for, for knowledge acquisition. Hope I didn't take too long. Thanks. No, no, this is fine. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, next in my view here would be Markus. You are muted, so please unmute yourself. And right. yeah, the others, please mute yourself. Uh, it's an exciting uh, uh, fact to figure out which order of people you see on your screen. Uh, everybody could be next. Right, so uh, hello, everyone. I'm, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's uh, very nice. When I heard about this introductory round, I thought maybe we should actually introduce the others rather than ourselves, because we have worked so much with each other that in many cases that would work pretty well. Um, well, anyway, here I am. So uh, some uh, people have already talked about uh, some stuff I do. So I'm uh, Markus Krutsch. I'm the professor currently of knowledge-based systems at the uh, Technical University of Dresden. And as such, uh, I'm doing research. Uh, if I have, a, well, a, a, well, more or less as a professor, you know how it is. Um, but uh, we are involved in uh, various kinds of knowledge-based um, research. Um, my actual uh, main field is theoretical computer science. I'm a theorist. Uh, you know, all these practical things I'm, I'm rarely getting involved with. Um, <clears throat> and so we are studying things like the 
capabilities, the expressive power of uh, knowledge representation languages, of uh, query languages that you can use to extract data and uh, computation in general. Yeah, what can you compute? Uh, that's the theory. And now um, in, in practice, well, if there is uh, practical uh, work as well, it's often related to reasoning. So we are generally interested in inferring new knowledge from what is given and in developing frameworks for doing this in a controlled and um, controllable and usable way. And uh, currently, one of the main uh, works we are doing there is in rule-based reasoning, which means we are using rules as an ontology language, as a data integration language to work with uh, several graphs, bring them together and uh, infer interesting stuff about it. Um, this also has led to some open source projects, which we are working with rule work being one, vlog uh, for j vlog being uh, others. Um, <clears throat> Well, that's uh, what we currently do a lot. This also involves some some of the bigger projects, uh, which are often interested in uh, AI topics these days. You know that everyone is interested in AI and everybody means different things when they say so. Um, we are often doing uh, symbolic AI, uh, meaning that we are interested in explicit knowledge, um, very much like what we have here in wikis things that humans can understand and work with and also that are uh, informative to humans that uh, can explain their decisions you know this is a big uh, want in uh, ai these days we can have a lot of fancy features which nobody understands and which fail randomly in places where we didn't expect them to fail because nobody understood why they worked in the first place so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that they sometimes fail but uh, it's uh, it's it, yeah you know it's a challenge yeah we are <clears throat> It's interesting too that uh, 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 AI is is a bit uh, you know viewed from very different angles these days. But I think knowledge has a big place in it, and we, um, uh, as a wiki community, as a knowledge graph community, of course, should uh, remind people that this is somewhat important if you want to really build usable, understandable systems that make connections to humans, that know their terminology, that understand the relationships that humans see in the world, uh, rather than just numbers in a network, maybe. Okay, um, as such, um, what was the question? So what is a knowledge graph? I could look at my own uh, lecture slides to figure out what I'm telling students. I think in general, okay, what is a graph? If you have a graph database, when are you allowed to call it a graph? I think it has to be connected. You have to be caring about connections. Uh, you can store all kinds of things in graphs, but not always are you caring about connections. And I see some people working with graphs uh, where they mainly mean unstructured uh, collections of facts and they don't really care much about the connections. So uh, connections should play an important role. Um, graphs also are very simple in their data structures. They are what database people would call normalized. So they use very simple data structures to store stuff, um, which is also an important feature and, uh, you know, connected and normalized. Most people think of this implicitly when they say graph and you don't have to tell them, but if I, I'm asked to define it, that's what I say. And what I think knowledge graphs should add on top is a certain richness, a certain depth of information, which is more than, you know, a simple network would, for example, have a, a friend graph in Facebook, I don't think is a knowledge graph as such. It's something that emerged something that was uh, not explicitly used to capture something and something that has a very simple structure. It doesn't even distinguish the types of friends you, you may have, for example. So uh, distinguishing uh, more structure and uh, beyond that, uh, adding context and in uh, specifying information about when something is valid, under which conditions, where you got something from, even if it's uh, just uh, the provenance of something, all of this have uh, important places in knowledge graphs and, and should not be forgotten. So I think it's more than just RDF in many cases. It's more than just the, the lowest level of the, of the graph structure uh, to really make it a knowledge graph that uh, you know we would call like that. Um, okay, I, I think, uh, have I answered all the, all the questions I should have been answered? I think for now. What is your favorite so knowledge graph? Oh, what's my favorite? Of course. Oh, well, okay. I'm, bit, I'm a bit biased. I mean, I, I really like Wikidata. I, I, I love uh, the stuff you can get out of it. But as Lydia said, if Wikidata is off the table, um, next thing, I mean, OpenStreetMaps is wonderful uh, and has, has really great uh, capacity of, of, of doing things. And it's also very rich in, in some places. And um, uh, uh, Wikimedia Commons now, should we call that a different knowledge graph? I, I, re I mean, it's, it's wonderful. You can figure out things like... Um, which camera do people use to shoot featured pictures? 
and so so you can i'm going to buy a camera maybe i will figure out what what are the people who make the really good pictures which which cameras did they use so this kind of thing you can can do now and I, i'm i'm quite uh, um uh you know uh, astonished by it and and love to play with it okay thank you the next in my view here is denny thanks <coughs> it's it's so great to be together with all of you again in the same room. Um, I don't think I've seen many of you for such a long time. It's, it's uh, thanks for this opportunity, uh, Bernhard, and for setting this up. This is really awesome. Um, hi, I'm Danny Vlandicic. I'm um, particularly probably interesting for this conference. And together with Marcus, um, one of the co-founders of Semantic Media Wiki, um, and then also together with him and Lydia, we set up Wikidata at Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, and after that, I joined Google to work on the Google Knowledge Graph. Um, and about half a year ago, I switched over to the Wikimedia Foundation, where I became, the, what's the title again? Head of Special Projects. Um, the goal is basically to create a project called Abstract Wikipedia where we are trying to first create a new Wikimedia project that um, has now preliminary got the name Wikifunctions. So this uh, came after a, a community vote. And the name is still um, uh, up to be um, approved by legal or not. So let, let's see whether it will be that or not. And the idea here is to have functions in a wiki that do stuff and then we can use it for example on a knowledge graph like wikidata and get interesting results out of that um, and the ultimate goal of that all is to generate wikipedia articles from a common source in different languages so that we can have much more knowledge available in many more languages and many more people can contribute to it so that's what I'm working on these days. Um, in terms of research interests, I'm very much interested in a, in a form of expressivity that is very different from the form of expressivity that Marcus um, uh, often talks about. It's, it's not about a kind of how reasonable is it and how many, uh, how many inferences can you derive from it um, and how much more knowledge can you unlock. Uh, but rather like I, I, I tended to, to to go down this road of how is how are knowledge graphs and how is knowledge representation in general different from what we do in natural language and can we get more of the features that natural language can do that knowledge representation usually can't do and what do we need to give up in order to get to that so um so to get to a place where those things are less usable for answering queries for answering um deductive systems to, to, to enable that systems on that but rather to to how can we push it back to to natural language results that can be read by um a lot of people um and across different natural languages, which is uh, one of the crazy parts of that. So um, so this is where I'm, where I'm trying to go to, and we'll see in the next year or two how far we will um, start walking down this path. Um, in terms of definitions of knowledge graphs, I would just quote Marcus paper um, on that if I were if I were asked or if I would be writing uh, something um, in in my experience the, the really nice features of what, what my knowledge graphs and this is something that Marcus and the others already have mentioned is the uniformity of the representation that it's just <clears throat> in most times just triples or whatever it is that, that constitutes a knowledge graph and that you can that you can make an analysis just over a single type of um, constituent element and um, and but what is important is definitely that each of those triples have a property so that if you look at it as a graph that the graph is an um, has named edges and that it's not just you know entities that are connected 
by uh, by a direction and a single edge, but, but rather that those edges are named and that those names and that the edges have directions and that those names are themselves amenable to further annotations and you can use stuff on top of them. So this is what, what I really think makes a, makes a knowledge graph. Um, the uniformity of the representation and, and the ability to have those named edges. The other important thing about knowledge graphs is that, and this is something I came to appreciate more and more in the last few years, is that it's, and it almost sounds counterintuitive, uh, counterintuitive. It's less about the actual facts and data represented in the knowledge graph. Um, it's less about, you know, um, the, 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 the knowledge graph, rather about identifying entities, which is the real value of knowledge graphs, that you have a catalog of entities um, that you can reuse in different, um, that you can reuse in different contexts that you can help with unifying the catalog of interesting entities across different um, parts of your organization, across uh, different parts of your project and so on. Um, and this is, uh, so the, the identifying power of a knowledge graph is really um, super important, even more important than, um, you know, the fact that you have all this information in it, which can often be done by a traditional database as well. My favorite knowledge graph is most obviously Wikidata, um, no question about that. Um, if we would drop Wikidata, I'll probably go for like, so I've been using a semantic media wiki for several years in my life as a diary, research notebook and everything. And this is a super useful, it's, it's by now it's pretty stale, but it was such a super useful little knowledge graph that I built in the semantic media wiki. And it wasn't that little actually at the end. And I had so many interesting queries I could do uh, on that, like, oh, where did I all travel? Where did I have talks? And who did I meet and stuff like this? And visualize this with my semantic media wiki stuff. I really, really enjoyed that knowledge graph. Um, and if that also doesn't count, then I actually go for the Google Knowledge Graph just to have been there and experienced this this huge knowledge graph and the, the new problems that happened because of that, uh, just because of the size and everything. Um, this was definitely uh, also a, a really great knowledge graph to, to work and play with for a few years. So I hand over the deal to Ah, it's up to Ben. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> Next one in my list, thank you, is uh, Emmanuel. Hello. Um, so my name is Emmanuel Sal. I've, uh, I'm a uh, assistant professor at TU Wien and recently actually returned to Vienna. Uh, the last five or so years, six years, I was uh, um, director of a large knowledge graph lab at Oxford. And uh, we very much worked on a, a similar direction of topics that Markus talked about. So building scalable reasoning systems, bringing theory to practice, uh, making, making such reasoning or knowledge graphs work. And uh, now I'm back in Vienna. I've been welcomed back very uh, uh, um, warmly by uh, Martha and, and Axel. Uh, uh, and uh, now I'm, of course, still uh, doing research on the topics that uh, uh, scalable reasoning bring with it, uh, with it but um, also looking very much on financial knowledge graphs. So uh, financial knowledge graphs are a great topic because they combine a lot of the challenges that Markus and, and Danny kind of uh, alluded to, namely, first of all, this combination of AI techniques that is in it. So the need for explainability, you can't just make wrong uh, wrong calls or wrong decisions there because often it's regulatory it's it's you can, must be 100 percent sure and then the other parts where you need uh, other no, machine learning based reasoning techniques not logic based reasoning techniques like what i would typically use most of the time so it kind of challenges your your repertoire of uh, techniques so i like the field quite a bit and that's where i'm currently uh, doing a lot of research in um, so, 
Yeah, towards the question of uh, what what is the what the defi good definition of a knowledge graph is, I have one textbook answer and one actual answer, and I think the real answer uh, is is close to what I think Marta said before. Uh, but let me get give you the textbook answer first. Thankfully, it hasn't been uh, mentioned so far. Let me see whether I can drag it over. Does that work? Uh, so that you can no doesn't work good no there it is ah yes now i have it dragged over so uh that's a definition by uh, uh erlinger and uh, and uh, verse which says a knowledge graph acquires and integrates information into an ontology and applies a reasoner to derive new knowledge so uh, probably very much into what uh, what uh, uh, Markus said before the only thing i added to it is we need scalability these days because uh uh, without scaling to the sizes that we are all used to, uh, that's that's not uh, going to help. So, after I give you the textbook answer, I think the real answer is what uh, Marta said, namely, uh, it, it's the thing that actually connects a lot of those areas. We need uh, how do you uh, build a financial knowledge graph if you don't have natural language processing entity? Uh, um, recognition and a collection of entities where you match things through you have reasoning you have a lot of these things you have explainability uh, you it's a basically a good combination where a lot of the techniques including uh, a semantic media wiki come together uh, to be used by multiple uh, communities and i think that's the strength of it and uh, yeah let me give an example for that because one Thing we are also, of course, here is to discuss where semantic media media wiki uh, fits into this. I will give you an example from uh, from financial knowledge graphs, and uh, these are somehow, unfortunately, some of the very clo most closed knowledge graphs there are, and it's really hard to get uh, for uh, players, companies, uh, uh, normal people to actually contribute to that, uh, and actually there are the data entry side, so getting data into it or giving tools to organizations for making some of the data public is actually quite important and that's why I think uh, that's a very good thing and uh, that's also why what I will uh, say is my answer to what's my favorite knowledge graph right now uh, to give something different there I would say it's the currently non not publicly or not at all existing world financial knowledge graph that contains information about all companies and uh, people re related to that. And actually it's a challenge to be building it with some of our partners. We are building that, but also there, I mean, each organization has a very tiny part of it. And my dream knowledge graph would be one that actually contains a lot of that information because we can solve a lot of the questions, the AI questions that all people are uh, wanting uh, uh, wanting to answer, including uh, some related to current situation. Because, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, I think the last uh, regular talk before us talked about, namely uh, the current situation uh, that uh, that COVID doesn't only have an effect on on medicals uh, on the medical part, but also on the on the social sciences and even on the central bank sector, which uh, which he mentioned in the last talk, and uh, that's something we we as a community and uh, everybody in this round and many of those listening uh, right now are probably in a perfect place to answer. So that would be my answer. <laughs> good, good. So by now I think I uh, I know who the next one is, yes. <laughs> but I leave it to you, uh, Bernard, to <laughs> hand over. Actually, you, you did not want to go first. Uh, it was really a coincidence that now you are the last. I, I, I can prove it. I made a screenshot. So... You are muted, Axel. That's embarrassing. So yeah. I, thought, I thought that um, some of you had slides and then I was panickingly trying to prepare slides, but since nobody now presented slides, I will also not do it. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, but I will uh, use my slides to <laughs> tell you what I wanted to say. So basically, hi, my name is Axel Polaris. I'm a professor in Vienna at VU, uh, University of Economics and Business, and um, heading there an institute on data and knowledge engineering. So in a way, you could all be call, also call me 
like a semantic web, almost dinosaur. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, like uh, having worked with semantic web technologies since quite a while, uh, beginning of the millennium almost, <laughs> and before with knowledge representation things. Um, and um, also, I could consider myself as a proud member of the so-called semant uh, pedantic web group. So I don't know whether anybody of you remembers that, but we had like around 2007, we kind of uh, tried to enforce on all the RDF data we found out there by crawl writing crawlers and so on, um, to really de check in much detail, are the linked data principles followed, um, do they comply to OWL, um, and so OWL not, 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 not fall into OWL full and whatnot. We wrote lots of like um, verification and, and started this crawling and, and trying to work with um, RDF and uh, link data on the web. Um, so um, that maybe let me start with the answer to the what's my favorite knowledge graph then, and the answer is quite self-explanatory there. My favorite answer is the, I don't show slides, but I can paste the link in the chat. So you see this, you all know it, yeah, the famous lot cloud. <laughs> so, um, and it's, um, well, it's not a single knowledge graph, and that's why it's so nice, because it's rather a collection of interconnected knowledge graphs. And um, still, it, it's not perfect. Um, it's actually quite non-perfect. So um, first of all, it doesn't grow anymore as fast as it did in the first few years. So maybe not all hopes, all hopes have been fulfilled. Um, in a way, if you look at it more closely, it looks a bit like a cheesecake because these um, bubbles in this lot cloud, um, they are not generated automatically from crawls, um, but from people who submit metadata to explain what they do and to which other graphs they link, so which, which is not perfect. Um, in fact, when we tried to crawl this lot cloud, we found out that around um, half of it, or more than half, it was actually almost only one third of the nodes were actually accessible still. Um, and um, basically, some, many of the data sets did not contain the referenceable URLs, so um, annoying us as pedantic web group. Um, and um, this was a bit frustrating. So also what we have to say is that uh, when we look at this research on linked data and semantic web, that many of the nice tools that our community has developed there um, are no longer available. Um, so for instance, they have been built up on this lot cloud. Um, so search engines like CMDJ, if you now go to cindj.com, you find some Chinese web page. I don't know what it is, but it's quite interesting to see um, that this is disappeared and uh, something else is there. I don't know what it is. But um, this this is kind of unfortunate because um, although there is successes with Google's Knowledge Graph and Wikidata and so on, this idea of basically a decentralized interlinked uh, network of knowledge graphs, so this meta knowledge graph, is not yet um, true. So. But I still think it's something valuable to um, pursue. Um, there are some challenges around it, like, for instance, the sheer size of these knowledge graphs. If you look at uh, Wikidata as such, um, we just tried recently some experiments about decentralized uh, knowledge graph theory. And um, we didn't include Wikidata in our experiments uh, because it simply didn't scale to that. So, but we are not alone because many um, Sparkle engines even the Sparkle engine on the query service of Wikidata times out on a lot of queries. And that's kind of so we, we still um, need to think about how we can scale our technologies to work with it. Uh, anyway, that's a nice research topic and it's, it's great to have that. Um, so another thing is that um, the, we could also try with dumps of knowledge graphs, but they, these are also not available. So there's many problems with these knowledge graphs. Um, we try to analyze um, this in data cloud, which is also super interesting. Um, like, for instance, um, analyzing the number of links. So if you look at this no a lot cloud picture, you always see links between those. And the numbers that are given there are actually, uh, again, metadata provided by the, uh, by, the, by the publishers of these knowledge graphs. And I think they could be computed. The problem is that there is no really um, a systematic um, way of declaring what is a link from one knowledge graph to the other, because the ownership of a URL to one knowledge graph in this lot cloud is not clearly defined. We tried recently to, to write a paper um, to define some heuristics, how to actually assign that and then compute things about knowledge graphs. If you want to know more about that, um, I can either paste the chat uh, link later to the chat or, or you can drop me a message. Um, another thing that we recently started, and that uh, brings me back to the definition of knowledge graphs. 
um, is, well, what's my favorite definition of knowledge graphs? My favorite definition of knowledge graphs is, of course, the one that came out of our Dutch tool seminar, um, where we, Boris said, the, what is the knowledge graph? We couldn't agree on the definition, so the best we can co could come up with was a graph uh, of data intended to accumulate and convey knowledge of the real world. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I think uh, in a later like survey, we extended this a bit to, to, to something that says whose nodes represent entities of interest and whose edges represent relationships between these. So what does it mean of interest? Um, and uh, somehow it already came through from what the others said. I think the problem is not the definition of what a knowledge graph is, but the definition of what knowledge is. So recently we, we talked to colleagues in our group who work in knowledge management from a more like organizational sciences perspective. And um, they are more into these works by Nonaka and so on. So basically about uh, knowledge, um, knowledge management and how knowledge actually emerges and is um, constructed. Um, some of you might have seen this Seki spiral where basically knowledge, the knowledge creation process is divided into four quadrants. One is socialization, externalization, combination, and internalization of knowledge. And we should ask ourselves maybe what no, what role can actually graph like structures or knowledge graphs play here? So um, of course, inference and symbolic reasoning on already explicit symbolic knowledge is one part of it. Um, but then there are some um, things that can actually be done and operate on the, on the non-symbolic um, level, maybe on the graph structure itself. So you can maybe um, uh, kind of create knowledge from analyzing the graph structure of knowledge. I think that's an interesting aspect. Um, and one aspect that is not so much covered yet in current knowledge graphs or research around knowledge graphs, but which some of you um, already mentioned, was actually the social aspect of um, of knowledge creation uh, and knowledge generation that basically um, like the, we have to understand not only the facts, but we have to understand how knowledge is created um, and the social processes, um, um, what, what Marta was saying, like um, causes and effects. And um, I think this is not yet. So I think we should be a bit careful with calling what we're doing knowledge graphs um, and considering these definitions of knowledge first before um, by the way, I still think it's a much better than name than semantic. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, now I would like to um, to to give uh, two opportunities. One is for the for the audience also to pose questions. So if you have questions to any of our panelists, please go ahead and uh, um, think about those. And I would like, as you have uh, mentioned, a lot of, of aspects now, and you all know each other, but some of you haven't seen each other in, in several years. I would like to give you also the opportunity maybe to ask each other questions because you heard now the introductions and you are now up to date. Uh, so, you know, does, does one panelist have a question to the other? Then you could just start, and uh, meanwhile, I will I will uh, look at the at the chat if there are questions from the audience to you. Do you have any questions to other panelists? I would love to learn more about this project that Danny was mentioning first, what he was currently working on. So <laughs> happy to answer. Um, yeah, so I said that. Goal is to represent encyclopedic the content of encyclopedic articles in an in a way that's abstracting from natural language, and then take those contents and translate them through rule-based systems, which are created by the community as well, to natural language output, which then can be used inside the Wikipedia's. So. Our assumption is we can't also come up with the um, with how to build this, how to construct this abstract content that also will be created by the community. So basically, the, the the language to represent the abstract content will be created by the community as well as the functions to take this content and translate it to natural language. This in turn will be using the lexicographic knowledge which is available in Wikidata. Um, in order to actually create the results. The 
idea is so, so the, the, the traditional example that I take is um, on the page of Marie Curie in almost every natural language you have the sentence that Marie Curie is the only person to ever have gotten two Nobel Prizes in two different scientific categories. And that's something that would usually not be captured inside of the knowledge graph. So, so Wikidata definitely can't capture it. Um, in OWL, you could somehow represent it, this kind of knowledge, but it wouldn't be pretty. Um, and and also, as, again, the goal is not to, to reason over this knowledge, um, even though it would be a nice secondary result if this would be possible. I'm not against it, don't misunderstand me. Um, I'm just the important goal for me is that this knowledge can then be this, this represented fact can be rendered in a natural language and can be rendered in any natural language that we support and be displayed to the users. So this is basically the nut that we're trying to crack. A little bit cross-language conceptualizations. I mean, there's so big differences on how languages are uh, are organized also grammatically. I mean, you know, I have I work with some Indonesian colleagues, and I know that some Asian languages don't have plurals. You, know, you just say the same word twice to have a plural. And there's so many other examples that you just think conceptually different. We have conceptual different conceptual models based on our first mother language that, that we learn. Right, and this is indeed um, one of the problems that we have, obviously. Um, so. What this, what this project is built on is on the, on the belief that languages are um, all equally able to express all of these things, um, even though it is, they do it in very different ways, obviously. So what we need is something that represents the knowledge that we want to say, um, that abstracts away from that, and then be able to and then be able to translate it. Now the thing is, it is indeed the case that in order to to um, create those renderings in some languages, you actually need some knowledge in your abstract representation that you don't need to represent in other languages. So, okay, to give, to give an example, to make it uh, a bit more simpler. Um, in a number of uh, Turkic languages, for example, there is no word for uncle. You always have to say if it's the if it's the uncle on your mother's side or on your father's side, or on even simpler example, um, grammatical genders, for example. Um, in some languages, you need to know whether the gender of the person you're talking about is female or male in order to be able to actually generate um, a sentence. Whereas in English, for example, you don't need to know. You're just um, don't need to know. So what we need to make a difference in the abstract representation is the knowledge that we have to represent in each of the um, in each of the languages and as well as a second kind of knowledge that we still need in order to represent it in specific languages but it doesn't have to be represented in all of the um, renderings. So it might it's, so the actual information content between the different languages is not exactly equivalent, but we have to make sure that we basically tag which parts have to represent it in all the renderings and which parts are only there because they are necessary for specific natural languages. Um, and in this way, we hope to be able to represent um, the, the knowledge in abstract way and be able to translate it in natural language. It might be that the result will be quite formulaic um, and not particularly interesting to read. Um, let's see where this will actually end up. But um, yeah, we'll try it out. <laughs> let's see how far we'll get. <laughs> cool. Okay, we, we already have several very good questions, I would say, from the audience. So maybe we should uh, throw in one. Uh, one is uh, again to you, Danny. What are the problems during working on the Google Knowledge Graph? Is it scalability, reliability, maintainability, or keeping it up to date? Um, it's all of them. Um, 
But the funny thing is, is yeah, it's all of them have been huge problems. Scalability has been a huge problem. Um, reliability, all, all of them, no question about it. But I think the biggest problem that we faced was really the social problem. It was the fact that you have a large organization. Google is huge. Um, there are more than 100,000 people working at Google. Um, you have a large organization. You have different, very, very strong products who have a very strong opinion on what a country is, what a song is, what a video is, what a movie is. And they say, okay, but you all want to share our information. This, this, it makes, this makes sense that we have, each of us has a list of countries, each of us has a list of cities, each of us has a list of videos, each of us has movies, etc. So you want to all take them from together. But then you bring them together into a room, in the best case, um, and have them ask, so what do you think is a country? And you suddenly have this huge fight starting. It's like, but this is not a country. This is silly. Why are you doing this like this and so on? So the... Um, Getting, and this goes back to the definition of ontology. You have to ask us about the definition of knowledge graph, but this this um, definition of ontology by by Gruber and later refined by Studer, which basically is, it's a um, it's a formal representation of a shared conceptualization, and there the magic word is the shared. And the biggest challenge that I've encountered working on the knowledge graph was in actually getting to a shared conceptualization of basic terms like country, movie, uh, and so on. So is there one Blade Runner movie or is it actually, I'm not even thinking about a sequel, the original Blade Runner movie, how many movies actually are there? There's so many different cuts of that. Um, about countries, is Scotland a country? Well, is the Roman Empire a country? If you say no, then good luck with presenting G uh, Julius Caesar. But there's, there's so many problems of that on the social level. All those technical problems are real problems, are big problems, need to be solved, obviously. But in my experience, the biggest problems that we had were really the social problems and figuring out um, consensus over large groups. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe something that is uh, related. Uh, sorry, I have to, to, to cherry pick questions here because there are a lot. Um, Maybe I would like to direct this to Lydia because it's it's uh, I think an actual problem maybe in in Wikidata, uh, how to prevent knowledge graphs to accumulate fake facts, wrong data, etc. What kind of consistency checks, quality controls, and and I, I might add to this question, um, uh, your answer is probably going to be well you have this uh, statements where you can where you can add the sources, but even then uh, let me give you a very simple example that I'm. Uh, struggling here with. Uh, in Wikidata, of course, there are uh, the number of inhabitants of cities. Uh, and there might even be re uh, references there that is, is from a, the official source, Statistics Austria. So I would say I can trust this now. But you know, somebody put it in and might have put it in uh, with uh, uh, falsely this reference. So uh, the colleagues here uh, at KDZ would not trust this, even if it says Statistics Austria, because they would want to have the file from Statistics Austria in front of them themselves. So how do you how do you cope with that? Yeah, um, <laughs> that that is basically the type of question that that keep me up at night. Um, I think, first of all, kind of going into what Danny was saying, um, when we say wrong facts, do we actually agree on what is a wrong <laughs> fact? Um, there's stuff that is clearly wrong and there's stuff that is clearly right. And then there's stuff in the middle where people disagree for many, many reasons. Um, but let's look at the stuff that's actually wrong. And I think there, um, at least for Wikidata, we can do a lot to make it better. Um, but we also, just like Wikipedia, um, don't have the illusion that everything in Wikipedia is going to be correct and uh, perfectly up to date and everything. So that is where um, information literacy comes in and people looking at um, what's written uh, with a skeptical eye, let's say, and uh, look at sources. I think for Wikidata, um, 
it has the advantage that um, information is machine readable and we can in the future we're not making enough use of that yet um, automatically check on a much larger scale than we could ever do that in wikipedia actually check if what we have is what is in that source that where we claim it's coming from um, and also check that regularly over time to make sure that uh, people aren't um, vandalizing it, for example, or that the world hasn't changed since we got that data, for example. Um, but that is a lot of work um, and still to be done. Um, other things, uh, consistency checks and so on um, were already mentioned. It's definitely a big topic and being used a lot already. And last, uh, I would add, getting that data used is huge, right? Um, any data in Wikidata that is used in many different places is much more likely to be watched by more people, is much more likely to be kept in good shape um, by more people. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, another interesting question I think uh, um, is, where do I find it? Yeah, it was what, actually the first one. Uh, what will it take to make knowledge graphs normal and natural for companies to implement? I think this is an interesting one. Who wants to answer this one? I can. Uh, uh, Axel, do you want? Shall I? <laughs> okay. No. If, I would like to hear it from Marta, to be honest, because she has been working a lot on... Uh, those systems and by making applications out of knowledge graphs in the systems. I can give a very short answer and then I want to hear what Emmanuel has to say. I mean, if I would know the answer, I would be a millionaire by now, I think, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so I think um, it's really almost always it's the knowledge acquisition bottleneck, right? So you you have an, a, a great idea of a system and you, you build ontology and, and you showcase it. And then what they tell you, okay, this is great, but, uh, you know, it's so painful to introduce all that knowledge that, that you need. And we don't have the skills, so we, we don't have the tools um, and so on. So I think a, a little bit of maybe better better tooling and more um, intuitive tooling that allows knowledge acquisition, bringing knowledge acquisition more to the, to the fingertips of, of people, that would be really essential. So this is, was our experience. It's always at the first stage, you know, <laughs> just getting the ontology, everything just fails there. Yeah. Manuel? Uh yeah, I mean, I think the, the question probably has a lot of different answers. And uh, I think that this this was a good summary for it. I have two uh, two things to add there. I mean, first, uh, uh, what will it make it normal for companies to implement knowledge graphs? The canonical answer in some ways is all of the big companies have implemented knowledge graphs in one way or another. So uh, in, in some ways, the question is, how do we make it possible for small and medium-sized companies to make it? And then getting a bit behind it and, and not just taking the label and saying, yes, we have a knowledge graph, uh, uh, perfect. Uh, it, the, the question is, what kind of services do people actually expect when they say, I need a knowledge graph in my company? They either expect natural language processing, they may expect uh, uh, rule-based uh, knowledge encoded in some ways. And... Uh, I mean, at Oxford, we worked with quite a lot of different companies on implementing knowledge graphs there, and everyone had a different kind of uh, expectation of what they wanted. Some wanted exactly the, uh, that natural language processing system that automatically ingests everything, and uh, with with a lot of uh, NLP and machine learning, uh, creates a knowledge graph of some kind. Others wanted something different. So the answer that Marta gave, namely, uh, the right offering the right tooling for it so that small and medium sized enterprises can afford to do that now okay what can we as researchers help uh, uh, doing that well obviously tools like like semantic media wiki may be part of the uh, exactly that story but uh, also uh, a lot of the automatization of of knowledge creation whatever we define uh, however we define knowledge will be there but uh, 
Uh, I think that uh, relates also to the second question uh, was there any suggestion how to introduce and create non-public knowledge graphs in organizations? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, there has been actually research on good processes for that. So there are papers out there saying what should be a good process of deploying knowledge graph technology in a company uh, at, at conferences like ICDE and, and so on. So people actually looked into that. Uh, but uh, yeah, the first thing is understanding what uh, people actually want as knowledge graph and then as Marta said, creating the right tooling. That would be my answer for it. Okay, thank you. This this brings me to an obvious question now that we that we're talking about tools. Um, the the obvious question, and some of you have a little bit addressed it, but I want to more explicitly ask it. Uh, my feeling is that the research community has lost interest in semantic media wiki i mean maybe because it's just old um what do you think we're, we're, our conference title is the future of knowledge sharing so what do you think that semantic media wiki uh could be the, the what could be the role of semantic media wiki in that aspect maybe in an from a research perspective maybe also from an organizational tool perspective uh and I would actually really love to hear Markus on this one first. What do you think, Markus? Thanks. Uh, so when you say lost interest, of course, uh, that depends on uh, where you see research. I think the question for us as researchers always is, where do we put ourselves in the, in the great scheme of things? I mean, what can we contribute and what should we rather not do? And um usually uh, research is is an enabler it's a it's an endeavor where you have a high risk to achieve something something that is so risky that people in industry wouldn't uh, usually try it because they would probably be bankrupt i mean of course startups can be extremely innovative that's no question but still um research has the place that you can just try something out that is completely um, outrageous and see if it if it if it makes a splash somewhere we did that so uh that's that's a, a, a fun thing to do and it can be very applied sometimes but once it runs and works of course um research moves to another level and i don't think that necessarily it means that research is no longer interested it just means that you need different type of research and so you need uh, possibly different people to do this research that is now necessary uh, we've heard a lot about social aspects so you need maybe to have people who have expertise in in methods that are related to social aspects if you want to research this um as i said i'm a theoretician so my uh work field is is slightly different so um i think this is this is an important thing that we see this as a trans transition i think i have been the second or third semantic media wiki developer not sure whether Danny or I was the first to, to get our hands on PHP um, <clears throat> and also this has has of course been built on on some things uh, but now I'm no longer a semantic media wiki developer in any active uh, meaning of the word and so things things move and we have to find a, a place to move it to and if there's no open research question that we think is so important that a researcher should address it then it's fine too I mean there's no uh Hopefully, you don't need the researchers to hold your hand if uh, you can do something uh, nice with this. I mean, uh, uh, that's the that's, that's hope, of course, that somehow once it works, uh, people can take it up and continue it uh, as well. Um, but I wouldn't say we've lost interest. We are always interested in, 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 in things, but we are usually interested uh, in, the, in the very new things, in, in what can be done on top of what is already there. Um, which is different from uh, what might be needed if you have a mature software product. Um, now, what was the second question? Uh, can you remind me what, what where this continued, Bernard? No, no, this this was actually yeah. This was okay. uh, the right. second uh, question uh, is was um, how, how in organizations, you know, what what uh, how how can you make it work there maybe. From a knowledge graph perspective, what could be the place? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think actually technologically we are still not there. I mean, we we there's many things that don't work well, and I think um, maybe also adding to the question for the companies, um, I think one thing that is currently not there is uh, to have a strong fundament for basing your own knowledge graph on. If you are in an industry which is not about you know. Uh, 
movies or general knowledge or you know maps uh, where you could maybe or medicine where you have also some things but uh, for many other areas for, when i talk to people in industry who build um, devices who build some kind of of machines there is no available uh, data collections that would be really useful to them. I mean, I, the kind of level of knowledge that we have in Wikidata or in other public knowledge graphs is, is far too shallow for their needs. You know, they have uh, thousands of different types of screws and uh, they, they, nobody has really the information on them and building it up is, is costly. So I think to get more information, to more, get more companies involved, one has to make a uh, inviting offers or have to, has to find starting points for them where they can start with a reasonable amount of investment. And that's, that's often a very difficult uh, point if you are from an industry where nobody has yet spent a lot of time to create a knowledge base for you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does anyone want to add to this? Maybe very quickly. So I, I completely agree with, with Marcus that, that in research you always look for new research problems and maybe with Semantic Media Wiki, the technology aspects have been now investigated and, and, and those are clear. However, there might be a second uh, interesting wave that uh, investigates how uh, Semantic Media Wiki is used in practice, right? Maybe studying the social processes behind uh, using uh, this software in creating knowledge, all the things that you know uh, Danny mentioned and so on. That that knowledge transmission is essentially a social process, and we know so little about it, yeah, because we are computer scientists. We we, we, we cannot even think about this because we are kind of discovering this whole new universe of social sciences. And I think it would be really interesting to work in collaboration with people from computer supported collaborative work and, and all these huge communities right that are doing this for, for decades to, to understand the social processes behind the knowledge creation where uh, the semantic mediality for example could be the instrument um practically you would look at the logs right of, of what people do and try to understand uh, to ground this in cognitive science potentially. So I think this would be an exciting uh, area, but this requires really cooperation with, with other uh, disciplines. So it's not just something that we uh, as computer scientists can do. Maybe, okay, thank uh, you. So um, on, on one of the previous, previous questions on, on this kind of fake information in knowledge graphs, so, so I think to some extent, um, one could say that the web is the answer because, um, I mean, maybe this has failed because we have uh, not succeeded uh, so far by siloed and uh, knowledge that basically leaves us in bubbles, but that's, I think, not the, uh, info, the fault of the information itself. But if you have, um, like, annotated the sources and, and the, uh, the information aggregated actually as a knowledge graph, then knowledge graphs and, and the web structure of it, where you can check basically sources and their credibility, um, hopefully by automated means, should be a solution to that problem and not the, the, the source, uh, in my opinion. That was to one of the previous questions. Um, um, on the one for tooling, I wanted to say, um, I mean, the, the question could be right, likewise played back. So um, what, where does Semantic Media Wiki see its role? Um, in this tooling, for instance, for supporting knowledge graphs. Um, I'm thinking of that from the perspective of teaching, um, for instance, things like data science, where we use now Jupyter notebooks or, or data science notebooks. And that's kind of like a um, really nice tool, which is interoperable, allows people to explain easily like data workflows, um, document their, their code and basically have so where's the same thing for data, right? So could Semantic Media Wiki be that, that, that thing for data? Um, that's I, it's things like, um, you know, I mean, this uh, notebooks enable things like Kaggle to work where people can basically um, store and, and retrieve and, and others work from that with their, with their, um, with their data workflows. Um, so maybe could we do the same for knowledge creation um, um, in terms of tools? So where's the, to be the notebooks equivalent for knowledge graphs, in a way. So it's just an, uh, an idea that came to my mind. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm now at a at a uh, interesting point in the discussion because as a student, you should not interrupt discussing professors, but as a conference organizer, uh, 
uh, I should be uh, aware of not taking too much of your time as well. So what I'm proposing now is that we uh, officially close the session and uh, as it is the last session of the SMWCon, um, we uh, have to officially end this conference. Uh, but uh, I can invite you to stay here and and if you if you have more time to further discuss with us. Uh, but let me first say uh, yeah, thank you to uh, Richard Heigl, uh, especially uh, who co-organized the conference with me this year. Uh, I think it has been a, a great uh, opportunity uh, to do this purely online. I mean, we are lacking the beer afterwards, but we uh, uh, are, uh, even have a, a Viennese coffee house and a Bavarian beer pub. So it, it was a little bit of, of uh, here uh, of uh, uh, trying to also uh, initiate uh, the other relevant aspects of a conference with 220 or so participants i think this is was really uh, worthwhile uh, usually smw cons have around i would say 40 to 60 people uh, and of course people like you would not attend usually because uh, you have moved on to so many other things that uh, you will not find time to attend a physical event somewhere in europe so i think this was really a, a unique opportunity um so thank you all um we will, uh, the uh, main panel sessions were recorded. It will take some time for us to compile this and upload it. There's a Semantic Media Wiki uh, YouTube channel, so they will be uploaded. Uh, we will tweet about uh, this when this is ready. Um, uh, for all the participants, uh, there are still 50 now uh, listening. Please uh, join in our community, uh, share our tweets and our, I don't know, LinkedIn and Facebook and where, where we are, where we are. Uh, join in on, on, on GitHub and on semanticmediawiki.org, where most of you now have an account also, thanks to this uh, conference. So uh, I would like to say uh, uh, goodbye for now and uh, remind you the next uh, dedicated community uh, event to enterprise uh, enterprise media wiki usage is the emw con that will be i think a physical event in the us in may next year so you might want to check this one out um, and uh, for all of the panelists now uh, i say thank you it was great having you here uh, but uh, you don't have to leave if you have more time uh, we can uh, still go on with our with our discussions it, they are very interesting i just don't want to, to to keep you longer if you have to leave or have to go so thank you for that and now let's see um, who still has time to to further discuss with us thank you very much mm -hmm.